we're seeing a, a sort of a, a broad array of strategies that depends on the the community that you're in. Um, right now, our, our research sites mainly focus on um, the silence of protesters, um, the use of encrypted messaging applications to spread disinformation, which are um, things like WhatsApp or Telegram that are um, really prominent spaces for people who have been deplatformed from mainstream media like Facebook or Twitter to move on to those platforms. And we're also looking into the usage of um, data in campaigns and more specifically the growing use of people's physical locations to target them with messaging. And a lot of, a lot of what happens is that these things are built, they're maintained, people use them for things like get out the vote campaigns and then through various reasons they either get co-opted by disinformation, actors spreading disinformation, or actors who are not actively trying to spread false information, but end up conf sowing confusion. Is my, is my data safer because Facebook is using end-to-end -end encryption, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Does that, but that might also mean that disinformation campaigns have a little more space to work in those closed spaces. So encryption, encryption is incredibly important and no one should touch it. If I had to paint with a large brush, like uh, a trend in political disinformation and data is that since 2016 campaigns have really pushed to be data centric and have pushed to keep and maintain as much data as they can inside of their own walls. A good example of this is the rise of campaign apps in the United States, where both the Biden app and the Trump app collect a lot of personal information, but they have very, they have different rules about how it can be used and when they ask for it. But and when they ask for it, but at the end of the day, they're still trying to get data from people because once they have it, they have it inside of their own silo and they can combine it with any other data they can get. In my view, it started, it definitely jump-started the arms race, in a sense, where um, no one is ignoring um, the power of data in campaigning anymore. It's just a question of how they use it. So the Democrats in the United States have a, are having a big internal battle right now about how much data analysis and, and hyper-targeted content they can use and still feel, I guess, ethical about it. Part of our research is thinking that maybe what the response to the arms race started in 2016 by the Trump campaign will be just a way of building data-centric campaigning in a scaffold that people are more comfortable with, but doesn't actually lessen the uh, the um, the power of the manipulation, if, if that makes sense. Um, and that's some of that comes along drawing cleaner lines of consent for the use of data, but those lines of consent are sometimes. Um, they're, they're kind of sometimes they're misleading in the sense that they're, they're just working around those lines of consent to still have ta political tactics that ultimately um, gain them more power. So um, I would say on, a, on the Trump campaign side, I would say that they've dug deeper and deeper into the data strategy um, and they will collect data. And if you read through their privacy policy, they really don't have any limits on what they can use it for. No, but they're getting there. Um, they're doing it more slowly, but they're also doing it in ways I think that are more maybe scalable or um, easily transportable. Um, the it, it feels like, like a lot of Republican campaign data strategy is collect as much as you can and use it for as much as you can at the moment. I don't want to say one is better. Say that one is better than the other. Siga las últimas noticias y los análisis sobre Estados Unidos y el mundo en www.elespectador.com.